familiar faces, and it's also good to see um, several new faces of people I haven't had the chance to meet yet. Many of you I have been able to meet briefly, and uh, it is a pleasure to get to be with you today. Um, for some of you who might not know me, my name is Josh, and then this is my wife Shonda, and as my dad mentioned, our five kids that are pictured behind me on the screen. Our oldest is Julian. He is 11 years old now, and then we have Tristan, who is almost 10, and then Abigail is 8, Eleanor is six, and our youngest, Gavin, is five. And for the last four years, we've lived um, in a small town up in the highlands of Scotland called Nairn. And um, so we've really enjoyed our time there, really have become acclimated to life in Scotland. And now we're getting reacclimated to the, the Texas heat because um, it is much cooler over in Scotland. And, and Philip informed me just a moment ago that it hasn't even got hot yet this year, so I'm, I'm not looking forward to that, but, uh, but it is great to be back with you uh, today. Um, we just have a small group of people that we're working with in Nairn, about eight adults that are interested in becoming a part of a church plant um, in that small highland community that we live in, um, but we've, God's just really given us a love for the people of Scotland, for particularly people in Nairn, and we've built great relationships with other Christians living in the area, other ministers. And uh, just excited about what God hopefully will do through our ministry in Scotland uh, in, the, in the months and years ahead. Um, today I wanted to just bring you a message from Matthew chapter 6. So if you have a Bible with you today, um, please turn to Matthew chapter 6. And our text this morning will be um, from verses 19 through 24. We've kind of been going through um, this book of the Bible uh, in Scotland. And so I figured I'd just share something that we've looked at uh, in recent weeks. So Matthew chapter 6, it's in the very beginning of the New Testament, towards the end of your Bible, Matthew 6, and I'll read verses 19 through 24. This is Jesus teaching here, and he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where th thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Our text this morning is right in the middle of really the most popular message ever preached. It's known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and it's found in Matthew's, Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through 7. And in this famous sermon, King Jesus is teaching his followers what life in his kingdom is meant to look like. And if I had to use one adjective to describe the content of Jesus' teaching, it would be the word radical. Radical. In Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he's presenting a series of really radical, revolutionary, countercultural statements and ideas. So far, uh, we don't have time to look at all of this, but so far, Jesus has taught that happy people in this world are not the rich, the famous, the popular, the strong, the successful. Rather, Jesus says that the truly blessed individuals are the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the pure, the, the peacemakers, excuse me, those who mourn, Amen. those who hunger and thirst after God, those who are persecuted, for their faith. Those are the ones that Jesus said, says are truly happy or truly blessed. Next, Jesus goes on to teach that the moral uh, teaching of the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, he taught that their teaching was inadequate. It was subpar. See, the Jews in Jesus' day, they assumed that it was enough not to murder. But Jesus said, you shouldn't even hate they thought it was enough not to commit adultery. But Jesus said you shouldn't even think about committing adultery. They deemed it appropriate to get a divorce for, for any reason, just as long as they submitted all the legal paperwork. But Jesus said you shouldn't even be getting divorces 
for illegitimate reasons. They thought they were doing what was right by keeping the vows that they made. But Jesus went so far as to say you shouldn't even need to make vows because your word alone should be sufficient. The people of that day, they understood personal retaliation to be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus said you shouldn't even retaliate at all. Probably the most famous thing that Jesus said, the most revolutionary thing, is is the people of his day thought it was permissible to hate their enemies. But Jesus exhorted them to love their enemies. Jesus is calling you and I as members of his kingdom to live counterculturally. And in our American context, I don't think that there's any passage that is perhaps as practical as Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Because in this important text, Jesus deals specifically with our pursuit of earthly treasure. Jesus teaches us how we as members of his kingdom are to view material things. I think everyone in this room would probably agree with me that we live in a society that is dominated by materialism. Um, According to research that has just been done at the end of 2020, uh, this is no surprise to us, but the United States is still the richest nation in the world with an average individual annual income of just over $65,000. Now, we may not feel rich, We may look at the things we have and we might not think we are wealthy, but compared to millions and millions of people living across the globe, we are living in prosperity. Even the poor in our society are very rich compared to others. The poorest families here in Arlington have far more than people living in other places today, and they also have far more than the people who would have originally heard Jesus' words in the first century. You see, in the first century, you were considered to be wealthy if you had more than one outfit. If people from the first century were able to sneak a peek into our closets, they would think that we were extremely wealthy people. Sometimes we feel that we aren't materialistic because everyone here knows someone who has more than they do. But I want us to realize that we are very wealthy. Not only do we have our needs met, but we are surrounded by luxury. We are accustomed to luxury. And because we are so used to the quality of life that we enjoy here in America, we often um, struggle. We're often in bondage to materialism without even knowing it. We are all affected by our consumer-driven society. And all of us, to one degree or another, we have prioritized. We've been guilty of prioritizing things over God. And, you know, this is a difficult message because we don't like the type of words that we're going to hear from Jesus today. And we don't like them because they're radical. It challenges the status quo. We like sermons that make us feel good. We like a Christianity that is comfortable, especially here in America. But, But the words of Jesus in our text today, they make us feel uncomfortable. They make us feel bad. The reality is that materialism, living with our focus on stuff is inconsistent with life in God's kingdom. One of my heroes, uh, he's, he's passed away now, but he was a famous English preacher called John Stott. And, and he once said this, materialism tethers our hearts to this earth. The wealth and the blessings that we particularly enjoy in America, they often keep, to, keep us from seeking God with our whole hearts. Materialism causes us to set our affection on things below instead of on things above like we're commanded to do. The focus of our passage this morning, we can really sum up with one question. What do you treasure? Or maybe better yet, what do you value most of all? Is it the things of this world or the kingdom of Christ? Before we move on any further, let's pray and ask God to bless uh, this message today. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to come and meet together, to open up your word, and I pray that the Holy Spirit uh, would, would open up our eyes and our hearts to receive the message that you have for us today, this radical teaching of Jesus. We confess, Lord, that we are unable in and of ourselves to live out these high, holy teachings of Jesus. Lord, we confess that we need the transformative power of your Holy Spirit to do so. 
And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength that we need that only comes from you uh, to lay up treasure in heaven, to live in light of eternal realities. And, Lord, I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In this passage, we have Jesus confronting us really with three choices, three choices that we all have to make. The first choice is a choice between two treasures. The second choice is a choice between two visions. And the final choice is a choice between two masters. That's what we're going to look at for the next few moments. Choice number one is a choice between two treasures. And Jesus wants us to answer the question, where are we going to store up our treasure? In verses 19 to 20, we see that there are really only two types of treasure. There's earthly treasure and there's heavenly treasure. According to Jesus, that's all there is. You know, I think it's, it's interesting when we look at our society, we are all treasure seekers. We're all enamored with the thought of finding treasure, of finding success and wealth and fame and fortune. You know, this is reflected in the, the countless books that have been written and movies that have been made, all about people searching for treasure. We have five kids, and so we obviously have a subscription to Disney+. Plus. It came out right before the first lockdown. It was perfect timing. It helped us entertain the kids during all those months of, of isolation where we weren't allowed to leave our home. Um, and, and so the other day I just typed in the word treasure in the Disney Plus search bar, and, and it yielded all these results. Treasure Island, Treasure Planet, Treasure Buddies, National Treasure 1 and 2, Treasure of Matacumbe, Muppet Treasure Island, Egypt's Treasure Guardians, Tinkerbell and the Lost Treasure, DuckTales the Movie, Treasure of the Lost Lamp, Tut's Treasure, Hidden Secrets, Lost Treasures of the Maya, all those movies and shows about treasure, and that's just Disney+. Plus. That's not Amazon Prime or Netflix or all the other streaming devices. Did you know there are actually still today professional treasure hunters? I, I didn't really know this, but there's a guy called Greg Stem. Um, he is the CEO of a leading salvage company. And over the course of his career, he's amassed over a billion dollars worth of lost treasure. The human nature is hardwired to desire wealth and fortune. The, the question is not, will we seek to obtain treasure? The question is, what sort of treasure will we seek to obtain? Treasure in this life or treasure in the next life? Let's start by defining treasure. What does Jesus mean by treasure? Well, both the verb lay up and the noun treasure that are in our text, they come from the same root word in, in Greek, and it's the word thesavros. It's where we get our English word thesaurus. The, it, we probably don't use those anymore, at least a, a hard copy. Maybe you have one on your phone, but a thesaurus means a treasury of words. And the Greek word th uh, thesavros, it means something that you store up or that you deposit for safekeeping. It refers to wealth that you collect or save. It's not something that you're going to use in the near future. It's not something we would define as a necessity. It's luxury, it's extravagance, it's having 50 uh, outfits in your wardrobe when you only need a few. It's having a six bedroom house when it's just you and your spouse living there. It's having three cars in the driveway when you really only need one. Jesus' point is that we must be careful not to hoard things. He, he does not denounce having things. Rather, he is warning against having things just for the sake of having them, something we're guilty of here in America. Jesus is talking about unnecessary extravagance. Something else I think that's important to note is that treasure here doesn't necessarily mean something that has great financial worth or value. It, it could be something that that doesn't. One writer defines treasure as this, whatever you value and protect. It, it may have minimal monetary value. It may be worthless to someone else, but it's something you cherish and delight in. That's what treasure is. Amen. Every person in this room, we all like different things. And therefore, your treasure in life might look different from my treasure or, or someone else's. Amen. Let me try to illustrate this. Uh, living in Scotland for the last four years, my boys have developed a real passion for soccer, or as the rest of the world calls it, football. And, and I've gotten into it. I've watched it quite a bit. I understand the rules and things now. I never grew up playing soccer over here, but I, I enjoy it. But I don't have the same passion for it 
that they do. And likewise, I, I grew up playing baseball. Baseball is my favorite sport. Um, I, I grew up playing it. I was able to watch some baseball last night with my dad and my uncle and my grandfather. I love baseball. I have a passion for it. My boys like it, but they don't have the same passion that I do. Or maybe another example, I've, I've gotten into running over this past year. And um, I've ran a couple half marathons, and I'm training to run a marathon around Loch Ness in October. And, and every day when I go out to, to leave on, on a run, I run by this beautiful golf course. We have two beautiful golf courses in our town. And I'll look over at the guys golfing, and no offense to my uncle my grandfather, I have no desire to go out and golf. And, and they look at me, and they probably have no desire to go out and run 10 miles um, we all value and we all treasure different things. And Jesus says that we should value that which is eternal over that which is temporary. Amen. As a child of God, we should have a heart that is consumed with, with living for Him instead of living for things. In verse 21, Jesus makes this amazing statement. We've probably all heard it before. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What Jesus is saying is that people's actions, their choices, they're shaped by the things that they cherish most. What you prize is what you will pursue in life. Amen. What you treasure, what you deem to be the most important, it reveals the state of your heart. I was reading a book recently and the author made this statement. I thought it was really powerful. He said, identify a person's goals and you will identify their God. Identify a person's goals in life and you will identify their God. You'll identify who or what they're serving. What your heart loves most will be revealed by where you store up your treasure. Do you store it up here or are you storing it up in heaven? Amen. Jesus gives us a command here at the beginning of this text. And, and Jesus' command has both a negative component and a positive one. Let, let's start with the negative. Jesus says, lay not up for yourselves treasures Upon earth. Now there are two ways that, that the Greek here in verse 19 could be translated. Jesus could be saying, don't treasure up treasure on earth. Or he, he could be saying, stop treasuring up treasure on earth. To those here in the room today who, who are young, who have their whole lives ahead of them, Jesus is saying, if you're thinking of devoting your life to storing up treasure here on earth, don't do it. And, and to those of us I'm including myself maybe now in this. I'm, I'm 32 now. I'm not as young as I used to be. But those of us who are more seasoned in life, who are already engaged maybe in, in living for materialism, Jesus says, stop it. Repent of your materialism. Quit being so focused on earthly things. Now, all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, um, I don't have time to show you this, but all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been condemning the actions of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the hypocrites, the actors, uh, the ones who wanted to have center stage. They wanted all the glory for themselves. They weren't concerned with giving glory to God. And, and Jesus has been addressing um, the, the way that they behaved. And I think he's doing that here as well, even though the Pharisees aren't mentioned in the verses that we, we are looking at. You see, the Pharisees viewed wealth as a sign that one was right with God. For many in Jesus' day, wealth was seen as really a divine stamp of approval on your life. If you were rich, that meant you were holy, you were blessed by God. And the opposite was then true. If, if you were poor, that means you were a sinner and you were cursed by God. Now the Old Testament does make reference to material blessings being given to those who serve and obey God. In De Deuteronomy 28, you can read that. It talks about all of these material blessings that God gives to those who obey His law. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 are familiar passages that talk about honoring God with the things that we have, and then God will cause our barns to be filled, uh, our, our vats to burst forth with wine. So th that, that concept is in the Old Testament. But the Pharisees had misinterpreted these passages and they wrongly assumed that the more you had, the more righteous you were. And the less you had, the more sinful you were. So they went to great lengths to flaunt their wealth because to them, that was a symbol of their righteous status before God. That is why it was so scandalous for Jesus to say that it is more difficult for a rich man to enter into heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. 
that shocked even Jesus' own disciples because they thought riches equaled righteousness. Now, I don't want us to have an unbiblical view of material things. Being rich, having great wealth, is not incompatible with the Christian faith. No, we live in a society, sadly, where many people disdain the rich. We see that all around us. And they assume that if anyone has money, they got it by exploiting someone else. And that is not true. The Bible encourages hard work, wise investment, and so forth. There are certain biblical principles that when you put them into practice, when you follow them properly, it will often result in material wealth. There's nothing wrong with working hard and, and being wise and gaining financial resources. Job was, was the greatest men of all the East, it says in the Bible. Abraham had great material wealth. Some of the righteous kings of Judah were extremely wealthy. In the New Testament, there were many affluent individuals who supported Jesus and Paul by using their financial resources. Um, Lazarus, you remember Lazarus, Martha, and Mary? Often they would house Jesus and his disciples. Now to house and feed 13 guys, you, you had to have quite a bit of financial resources. Joseph of Arimathea, he was a very well-off individual, a member of the Sanhedrin. And he provided a tomb for Jesus to be buried in. You remember Lydia in Acts chapter 16. She was a businesswoman who used the wealth that she had acquired from, from creating these uh, purple goods and selling them to assist Paul and his companions. Later on we read that she opened up her large home as a place where the church at Philippi met. Amen. So having large sums of money, having great wealth is not sinful in and of itself. We should remember that. However... Having great wealth is very dangerous because riches have a tendency to corrupt. It can become something that leads us away from God when we allow it to exert control over our lives. You remember King Solomon, the wisest king in in Israel's history, and he was drawn away by the pagan women that he married. He had 700 wives and 300 wives concubines but it's also what's also included in the old testament narrative is that he disregarded the warning that was given to israel's kings in deuteronomy not to multiply gold and horses material things solomon's solomon did pursue wealth just like he did women and the women that he had and the wealth that he had accumulated they ultimately led his heart astray but notice jesus's emphasis in the command here he says lay not up for yourselves Lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth. He's not condemning all accumulation of resources. He's not prohibiting you from having a savings account at the bank. The issue is not wealth per se, but the way that we use our wealth, why we obtain wealth and and how we use it. Are we storing up things to use in service to others or to use in service for ourselves? Earthly wealth isn't wrong to have, but it should ultimately be invested in heaven. There's a writer called Sam Storms, and he says this, Materialism is not a problem with possessions, but with perspective. The issue is not how much you have in your grasp, but how tightly your grasp is on what you have. Having wealth isn't wrong, but hoarding wealth is. Jesus wants us to have the proper perspective concerning wealth and treasure in this life. And ultimately, he wants us to pursue heavenly treasure rather than earthly treasure. Now, why does Jesus want us to do this? Why does he warn against treasuring up treasure here on earth? Well, the simple answer is because it doesn't last. It's temporary. It's transient. When you stop and think about it, storing up treasure here is a really bad investment. If you're a parent here today, you've probably dealt with the same issue my wife and I have dealt with over the years on buying your children shoes. You have basically two options. You can go to Walmart, or in our case over in the UK, Asda or Tesco, and you can buy the cheap shoes. And and you'll feel like you're saving a lot of money initially because they they were quite inexpensive, but then they don't last more than maybe a month. Your other option is you can go out and you can buy Nike or Adidas. You can buy a, a name brand shoe that will last longer, but often you worry that maybe your kid's feet will grow rapidly and they'll grow out of that shoe. So sometimes we've realized in our life that buying the more expensive shoes is the better investment because they last longer. You can pass them down uh, to the kids that come after. 
But Jesus is wanting us to see that it's foolish to treasure, lay up treasure on earth because treasure on earth doesn't last. And he gives three examples of how treasure on earth is temporary. In New Testament times, wealth really consisted of mainly three things. Money, expensive clothing, and storehouses of food and grain. If you were rich, those were the three things that you had. That's what made you rich. And Jesus shows that all three of those things are temporary. He starts by talking about moths. Moths would destroy clothing. They would come in and they would eat through uh, people's clothing. And what's even more important is the rich in that day, they would often weave gold threads into their garments as a way to show off their wealth, but also as a way to store it. And so what Jesus is saying is moths can come. They can eat through your clothing, destroying your clothes and, and also causing your gold to be lost. And then, and then next, um, Jesus talks about vermin, uh, the, um, mice and, and worms and rats that could eat through uh, things. The word translated rust, it could be referring to maybe a coin uh, becoming rusty, but when you think about it, if you find an old rusty penny, it still possesses the same value as a, as a bright, shiny penny. So the Greek word literally means to eat away. And so I think it's more likely a reference to the loss of crops and grain due to worms, uh, mice, rats. So he's saying those storehouses of grain that you have, those bags of grain, the, the mice, the rats, they can eat through and destroy your wealth. And then he talks about thieves. Thieves, the word translated break through, it literally means to dig through. Houses in the first century in the ancient world, they weren't made of brick or aluminum siding as they are today. They were constructed of baked clay. So thieves could dig through the walls and they could enter the house and steal the contents inside. Jesus is saying earthly treasure, the treasures that we're so intent on storing up, they won't last. They're not secure. They can be destroyed. They can be stolen. Only treasure in heaven is ultimately secure. And then Jesus moves into a positive command. He says, don't lay up treasure on earth. And he goes on to say, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven because moth nor rust can destroy, thieves can't break through or steal. Laying up treasure in heaven is superior because your investment is secured by God and the dividends will be enjoyed for all eternity. Now the question everyone's probably asking is how do we lay up treasure in heaven? And I'm going to answer that at the end of the message, but I want to quickly move on to choice number two, and I'll be really brief on these next two choices. Choice number two, we've looked at a choice between two treasures. Secondly, we have a choice between two visions. What is your view of wealth is what Jesus is wanting us to ask, to answer. That's the question he wants us to answer. In verses 22 through 23, Jesus gives his audience really a sermon illustration. Now, pastors, ministers, we give sermon illustrations as a way to help make things easier to understand. But if you're like me, when I read verses 22 and 23, you were probably thinking to yourself, what on earth is Jesus talking about? I have no clue what he's, what he's getting at. And what's more is the commentators, the experts, they're not really sure what Jesus is talking about either. It's a very difficult illustration for us to understand, for us to relate to. But I'm sure it's something that would would have been well understood by Jesus' original audience. But let me take the study that I've done on this and just boil it down to two simple things. Here's basically what Jesus is getting at. As the human eye gives light to our bodies so that we can see where we are going when we walk, so our spiritual vision affects how we walk and what we do with our lives. That's basically what Jesus is saying. And there's two components to this. First, Jesus wants us to be single-minded. Single-minded. Jesus speaks of an eye being single. And he's referring to being single-minded in your focus, not being distracted by other things. If the aim of your life is single-minded devotion to Jesus, then you, you won't be caught up in materialism. The second thing Jesus wants us to see, I think he's emphasizing, is generosity. Generosity. And you might be thinking, where are you getting generosity out of those two verses? Well, you have to do some, some study of the initial context that Jesus was speaking into. The idea of an eye being evil, it likely refers to the Jewish concept that would have been popular in that day of the evil eye. Now, have any of you ever been given the evil eye before? My, my mother used to give me and my siblings the evil eye all the time. 
And from time to time, I get it now as an adult from, from my wife. But the evil eye, the, the evil eye to the Jew, it didn't mean looking at someone with disdain or disapproval. It meant looking at what someone had with the desire to have it for yourself. The evil eye really referred to being selfish and greedy. So Jesus, I think, is saying in contrast to an evil eye that is greedy, believers are to have a good eye. They are to be people who are characterized by radical generosity. Here, here's the point. If our vision is clear, if we are single-minded and fixed on that which is eternal, then our lives will be full of light, full of wisdom, full of insight. If we have the right perspective, we will not look with an evil eye of envy at what others have, Rather, we will take notice of the things that they don't have and seek to help meet their needs. The key to this illustration is the right outlook leads to the right outcome. That's what Jesus wants us to see. If you have the proper perspective regarding treasure, if you possess a single-minded devotion to Christ, it will manifest in your life in the form of generosity. Amen. So briefly, let's all conduct a little spiritual eye exam this morning to determine uh, if our actions reveal a heart of greed or a heart of generosity. If someone were to look at your annual giving statement, would they conclude that you were a generous person? I know that's a hard-hitting question. I, I, I was convicted over this writing this sermon myself, which you should be every time you write a sermon. It should affect you first. Uh, what about this question? Do you spend more on entertainment than you give to your church? Do you spend more on vacations every year than you do on charitable giving? Do you spend more on eating out than you do on meeting the needs of the poor? Do you struggle to have enough money to give away to others because you've stretched yourself so thin paying for all these things that you really don't need? This is hard-hitting stuff, but Jesus wants us, He wants you and I to answer the question, how's your vision? You know, when I think about going to the eye doctor, there's, there's three types of patients that you encounter at an eye doctor. The first group, they go in and they have perfect 20-20 vision. And I have to admit, I'm very jealous of those people. I can't stand those people that go to the eye doctor, perfect vision. They can read the bottom line on the chart that I've never been able to read. And that they're out the door, no prescription needed for them. Then you have the second group of people, and they're the ones that are like me and my daughter, Abigail, who are essentially blind. Uh, I remember going into the eye doctor as a young boy. I'd worn glasses for a long time, and I didn't really think my vision was bad, but I failed the eye exam and found out that I needed glasses. And I received my new prescription a short time later, and I remember being so amazed. If you wear glasses, you'll know what I'm talking about, at how clear things become. You can see the, the leaves on the trees, the individual blades of grass. I missed all that stuff previously due to my poor eyesight. And, and maybe there's a few of us here today that are like that. Um, maybe we've been living for stuff our whole lives with absolutely no regard for spiritual things or for eternal matters. And Jesus' words to those of us who fall into that category are basically, put on these glasses, look at life through the lens of my teaching. And you'll finally be able to see what's truly important. You'll be able to see clearly the leaves on the trees and the blades of grass. But I think probably the third category is where most of us would find ourselves. The third group of people that go into the eye doctor, they just need their prescription tweaked a little bit. Maybe they're having trouble with seeing things far away or up close. Maybe they're getting headaches and they go in, they just get their prescription adjusted a bit. I would say most of us are probably in that position. We wouldn't think of ourselves as greedy people, uh, but when we're exposed to Jesus' teaching, we realize that our lifestyles don't always line up with how Jesus says we are to view material things. If the truth be told, we all, myself included, spend far more time laying up treasure on earth than we do in heaven. And Jesus is calling us to, to come in and get an updated prescription. We need to ask God to give us a clear vision. We need to plead with Him to produce that spirit of generosity within us uh, like we've never had before. We need our lifestyle to actually reflect what we claim to believe as Christians. The third choice Jesus gives us is a choice between two masters. A choice between two masters in verse 24. And here Jesus is asking the question, Who are you serving? Who are you serving with your life? 
the conclusion he draws is very insightful. He says, you cannot serve two masters. He doesn't say you should not. He says you cannot serve two masters. Now, by master, Jesus isn't referring to an employer. Jesus isn't saying that you can't moonlight. You can't work two jobs. Many of you have probably had to do that before. I did that for a short time when I was younger. He's not referring to you can't serve two bosses or employers. He's referring to a slave who was owned by his master. In the ancient world, every minute of a slave's life belonged to the man who owned him. So ultimately, a slave could only serve one master. In the same way, only you and I can only serve one master. We cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, now there's a funny word, mammon. What, what does mammon mean? Well, some translations just say money, but, I, but I, I don't like that. I think you lose the picture when you translate it as money because mammon means a little bit more than that. There, there's some debate as to the origin of this term mammon. Some think that mammon was the name of a pagan god. And I think that would, that would fit well in the context. You can't serve this pagan god, Mammon, and the one true God. Others say it was a Semitic term that the Jews would use that, that stood for both money and possessions, all materialism. Regardless of where the word comes from, I think its meaning is very clear. The, the famous Bible commentator F.F. F. Bruce, he wrote that Mammon is wealth personified. Mammon is wealth personified. Personified. It's the name given to the false god of materialism. The idol that millions and millions of people bow down and worship every day. And now I think some of us might be prone to doubt Jesus' words. We might think, he says you can't serve God and materialism at the same time. I don't think that's true. Many, many today think that they can. They say, God, I'll serve you more, but I'll also serve mammon as well. I'll go after wealth and success, and material things. The problem is that there's only room for one God on the throne of your heart. If you try to worship God and mammon, what will always happen is mammon will usurp the seat of prominence in your life that God demands and deserves. <clears throat> one pastor called John Piper, he said this, Money exerts a control over us because it seems to hold out so much promise of happiness. It whispers with great force, think and act so as to get into a position to enjoy my benefits. This may include stealing, borrowing, or working. Money promises happiness, and if we serve it, and we, we do serve it by believing its promises and walking by that faith. So we serve mammon by believing the promises that mammon offers us, that we'll have happiness and security, that life will be great if we just make more money. To serve mammon is to cherish mammon and pursue the benefits that mammon can give us. And to serve God means to cherish God and to pursue all the benefits that God can give us. Jesus is calling us to cherish God and seek him as the true treasure above all treasures. There, there are far more treasures to be found in serving God than in serving mammon. But often we believe the lie that mammon can actually make us happier than God can. But you know, you look all around us and you see that that's not true. Amen. Two main reasons. Number one, stuff can't make you happy. Stuff can't make you happy. It doesn't satisfy. Some of the richest people in the world are the most miserable. I think of a guy like Robin Williams who years ago committed suicide. Had everything anyone could ever want. Fame, fortune, but he wasn't happy. And, and that's a recurring uh, theme all throughout our, our culture. Right. Stuff can't make you happy. And number two, stuff can't be taken with you when you die. Amen. It doesn't last. How foolish it is to lay up treasure on earth instead of heaven. Right. Many of you are maybe familiar with C.S. Lewis. And maybe you've read some of his books. Maybe the kids have read the Chronicles of Narnia that he wrote. Um, but he once compared people who spend all their time focused on things of this world to an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday, as we say in Britain, or a vacation at the sea. And C.S. Lewis said that those who focus on material things are far too easily pleased. Our, our son last year, Gavin, we bought our youngest son, Gavin, what's called a mud kitchen. This was Shonda's idea, it was not 
my idea. I, I'm, I like everything to stay nice and tidy, and a mud kitchen is exactly what it sounds like. It's this little thing out in our back uh, garden, our backyard, that Gavin goes out, and he has pots and pans and a little sink, and he just plays with mud. And, and I guarantee if you went to our house in Scotland right now and went into our backyard, our back door, there'd probably be handprints of mud from Gavin. And, and Gavin loves to make those mud pies. But how foolish would it have been of Gavin if I came to him on the day we were about to leave to come to America and said, come on, Gavin, we're going to go to America and, and visit all of our family and friends and do all these fun things. And Gavin said, no, I, I'd rather stay and make mud pies in my mud kitchen. That's, like, that's what it's like for us. We have all this waiting for us in the new heavens and the new earth, the world that is yet to come. But we're satisfied with making mud pies. We're satisfied with things that ultimately have no value that won't last. Let me close by just giving you some three practical things. How can we lay up treasure in heaven? Three ways we can do this. Number one, seek God's glory, not your own. We kind of referred to this in our, in our Sunday school hour. Seek God's glory, not your own. I think if you go back and read in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in chapter 6, the treasure that Jesus has in mind in our text is the same as the rewards that he's been repeating over and over in chapter 6. He talks about laying up rewards in heaven by, by bringing glory to God and not ourselves. In verse 1, he's referring to practicing righteousness. And he says to basically beware of practicing righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them because if you do that, you will not be rewarded from your Father in heaven. In verses 3 and 4, he talks about giving to the poor. He says, when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing so that your giving may be in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. In verse 6, talking about prayer, he says, when you pray, go into your closet, go into your room, shut the door, pray in secret, and God will reward you openly. In verses 17 and 18, about fasting, he says, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, don't appear to be fasting to others, do it in secret. Don't do it for the glory that comes from man, and God will reward you. You lay up treasure in heaven when you worship God with the proper motivations. When you serve Him out of, out of a desire to glorify Him and not yourself. That's the first thing. It's pretty simple. S serve God. Serve God with a desire to bring Him glory. Seek the glory that belongs to God. Second thing you could do, simplify your life. And that's probably the hardest thing for us to do. But you, many of you have probably heard of the minimalism movement that, that's went about where people have downsized and, and they just have few possessions. And they do it for selfish reasons. They do it because getting rid of a lot of those possessions, it does cut down on stress and worry and anxiety. Uh, but, but I think Jesus is telling us to do it for spiritual reasons. Jesus seems to imply that you lay up treasure in heaven by not laying up treasure here on earth. If you avoid storing up material things here in this life, you won't fall into the trap of pursuing material things. Right. It, it, you won't fall into the trap of having a heart that wants to, to serve yourself. You, you'll be focused on serving God and Christ's kingdom. Amen. Get rid of the things in your life that hinder you, that keep you from serving God with a whole heart. Sometimes we must even put aside good things in order to pursue the greatest thing. We can accumulate treasure in heaven by not pursuing treasure here on earth. The third thing, and this is probably um, the, the one that's not found in this text, but if we jump over to Jesus' same teaching in Luke, we'll see it. In a parallel passage, we see that we, we lay up treasure in heaven by serving the needs of others through giving, through giving to the poor. Jesus taught these little teachings in the Sermon on the Mount all throughout his ministry. We have them in Matthew 5 through 7. Luke records them in his gospel in different places. But in Luke 12, 33, Jesus tells his disciples basically to take what they have, to sell their possessions, and to give it to the poor, to give it to the needy. He's very clear on how to lay up treasure in heaven. He says that you, by doing that, you'll provide yourselves with these money bags that, that don't grow old, a treasure in heaven that does not fail or fade away, where no thief can, can touch it. No moth will be able to destroy it. He says it very clearly. You lay up treasure in heaven by selling what you have and giving it to those who do not have. We ensure that we will have treasure in heaven by giving away the treasure that we have here on earth. 
And as Americans, we, we don't like to hear something like that. But that's what Jesus taught. And we look throughout the history of the church, that's what Christians have done Amen. century upon century. Let me just conclude um, by telling you a brief story. Many of you have probably heard of David Livingston, the, the famous Scottish missionary and African explorer. And he was buried when he died in Westminster Abbey. In London, you can you can go and visit that today. But before they buried him there, they they removed his heart from his body and they buried it in Africa, the place that he loved most of all. And that got me wondering if you if your heart were to be buried in the place you loved most during life, I wonder where it would be. Would it be the soccer field, the baseball diamond, the golf course, the gym, the office? Maybe your house, maybe the ladies here today, your closet, maybe your well-manicured lawn, your man cave, your vacation home. Where, where is your treasure? Are you cherishing God and seeking Him as the treasure above all treasures, or are you busy making mud pies, accumulating things on earth that, that won't last, that won't satisfy, and that won't be able to go with you when you leave this life? It's my prayer that the Spirit of God will cause us to hear and to heed Jesus' teaching today and invest our lives in, in gaining forever treasure in heaven rather than chasing after fleeting treasure here on earth. Maybe you're sitting here today and, and you're listening to the teaching of Jesus and you're not a Christian. I don't ever assume that everyone's a Christian that I'm speaking to. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you're not really into church. It's not your thing. You've never turned from sin and self, and, and put your trust in Jesus to save you. You've never bowed the knee to King Jesus and become a member of His kingdom. Well, I think Jesus told a very short story called a parable, especially for you. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to a very valuable treasure that a man found hidden in a field. And when this man discovered this, this great treasure in a field that didn't belong to him... Uh, he did what we would probably do. He immediately covered it back up. He, he hid it, and he quickly went out and he sold everything that he had so that he could buy that field and become the rightful owner of the treasure contained in it. Jesus is telling you and I today that the kingdom of heaven is far, far more valuable than anything we could ever accumulate here on earth. How foolish and how tragic Jesus said it would be for a person to gain all the treasures of this world and then die and lose their own soul. That, that's the ultimate unwise investment. And Jesus gives you two choices today. You can live a short time on earth for yourself, reject the gospel, die in your sins, and face judgment, or you can turn from your sin and trust in what Jesus has done for you through his death and resurrection so that you could be forgiven, so that you could enter into a relationship with God so that you can receive eternal life. Let me encourage you today to choose Christ instead of the things that this world has to offer. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I do thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be here today. Thank you for the freedom that is ours in this country to worship you publicly without fear of persecution. Lord, we're thankful for the teaching of Jesus that we have been confronted with today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help all of us by your spirit to be people who seek treasure that lasts forever in heaven and not people who seek after treasure that is, that is soon to pass away here in this life. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to seek your glory and not our own. Help us to be people who simplify our lives so that we have the freedom uh, of time and energy and resources to do good to others. Help us to be willing to, to not have a tight grasp on the riches that you have given us as Americans, but help us to, to be willing to give that away in service to others, to serve the poor, to serve the needy around us. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today who, who is not a believer in Jesus, I pray that by your spirit you'd remove their, their heart of stone that it has went years rejecting you and that you would replace it with a heart of flesh that desires you as the treasure above all treasures. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.